Welcome to CIHT Podcasts. Welcome to the CIHT Podcast. Today we do something a little different. We play a recording from one of our webinars. CHT run a huge range of webinars for people and they're a rich source of learning for people in the transportation industry. So do have a look at the website for more information. In this episode, we play a recording from one of our webinars in January. So why are we sharing this now? Well, the topic felt right to share. Given there was research published this week commissioned by England's Economic Heartland that said the legacy of COVID-19 could transform capacity on the roads in its region, removing around one in nine peak hour vehicles. And as of Monday this week, most legal restrictions on social contact have been lifted in England. It felt a good time to look at what the impact of COVID has been and might be for the future of transport. Welcome to today's webinar, the first in a series where we explore how COVID has, will and above all should change our world. Today is the first webinar in the series and I'm delighted to have the thoughts of Professor Nick Tyler from University College London. Nick and I have spoken before, so I just want to set expectations. This will be a discussion that will range from big topics to small topics far and wide. And Nick has a unique ability to draw together different disciplines, from engineering to neuroscience, to architecture, to transport planning, just to name a few. And then look at how these connect together to make the world a better place. So please do keep your questions broad and and feel free to ask things that you feel fit within the topic of today's webinar. So please just type in your questions and we'll draw on them as as things develop. But as a starting question, I would say the pandemic has forced change on all our lives. And I want to explore with Nick how things could change and whether that change could actually be a good thing. Could it be a turning point, not just for individuals, but for societies? So Nick, do you think this experience calls for a rethink of how we think about transport? Hi, Justin. Yes, um, I think the straight answer is I think it's a, actually is a really exciting opportunity. Um, you know, in a way, the pandemic has caused us to sort of put, put it on a sort of full emergency stop with all the handbrakes and everything we could possibly do and then do something else. And I think actually the great opportunity is not actually um, to try and go back to wherever it was we were before, but actually to say, We've got a fantastic chance here to do the kinds of things that we would have done. And we have seen some of that. I mean, I think the the rollout of um, cycling schemes, pedestrianisation, these sorts of things, um, and the speed with which those were put out would never have happened without the pandemic. And so, um, and some of those, of course, will go and some of them will stay. But I think I think it just shows that when you actually sort of clear the clutter out of the way you things can be done and you can and you can do things even though of course the pandemic itself is of course a tragedy uh, and and a terrible thing for for people and we've lost a lot of lives and this is never a good thing but actually we should learn from disasters and and not go back to where we were before because all that will happen is we'll just have another one so i think that's true so to me i think the, the, my starting point on your question is I think employers have learnt that there's quite a lot of jobs that they thought to get them done, you had to sort of chain a person to a desk from nine o'clock till five o'clock and they had to do it there and then and then they went home and that was it. Um, And I think that reality has not been around for quite a long time. But a lot of employers have thought that about certain jobs. Some jobs, you, yes, you do have to do that. You know, you're not going to do neurosurgery on your kitchen table. No, that's you need facilities and you need to be in certain places for some things. But there's a lot of a lot of jobs that are are actually movable. And the pandemic has shown employers that these kinds of jobs actually these people they will do it at home. And they or wherever they're going to do it, and and they don't need to be tied into the office. So I think what that's done, and it, and how it affects transport is it really calls into question why are we taking all these people, sticking them into public transport at ridiculous densities, so that we can get them to work at nine o'clock in the morning and take them home again at five o'clock in the afternoon, in the centre of a city, and. If you sort of think, well, actually, 
if we don't have to do that, the transport system actually could change quite a lot. You know, London takes what one and a half million people a day across the circle line. If you imagine the circle line like a, a marker, it's about one and a half million a day cross that in the in the pre-pandemic and another million come in from outside London altogether into that area. If you actually cut that by half, for example, just as a random number, um, that would alter tremendously what the um, uh, density of public transport and so on. And, and you know, when I spoke to transport operators in London about this, their first thought was, this is horrific. This is what this means is I will um, we'll lose money. We won't be able to, you know, where's the income going to come? Where's the revenue going to come from? Without realising, actually, that the cost of a lot of the transport system is to supply that peak. And so if you actually even it all out, and so that you didn't have the peak, but you had many more people travelling in the off peak because people have changed their working times. Um, and if you actually change where they're working, so not necessarily people working at home or in an office, but actually working in other kinds of establishment. You know, um, what used to be called Internet cafes and things like there are all sorts of different you know, working experience environments that you can have now, but they could actually be in the suburbs. And you could actually have people uh, moving around and choosing which suburb they wanted to work in today for whatever reason. And your transport system would need to reflect that. So you're, so it could have a profound effect on the transport system, which would enable the network concept to be changed, that would enable uh, people to be able to have much, much more choice about how and when they work. Um, and you take away the whole sort of pain of actually having to travel in the peak so it could have a profound difference you mentioned pain there and i think one thing is the sort of experience but then also the feeling of time being lost uh, that people's time is lost to commuting and it's not i think people looking back on their lives don't go oh what a wonderful life i had commuting to work i mean most people don't have that luxury i think yeah. so the idea of the 15 minute city seemed to gain traction last mm. year something we we explored as as an institution, but I was wondering what your thoughts were. Do you think we should be trying to create 15 minute cities? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the idea is is really good. I, I where I stick on it a bit is the 15, and actually tying the city simply to time. Um, so the first thing I would say is um, I would rather talk about neighbourhoods. Um, and that's kind of what the when you look at what turns out to be in this 15 minute thing um, city, um, to me, it's a neighborhood. It's 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 what the kind of question that we ask uh, city people around the world is, you know, what do you need to do every day? What are the kind of everyday needs? And you should be able to do that within a reasonable, reasonably short time and ideally without any need for needing to get into a motorised form of transport. In other words, it should be essentially walkable, um, coverable at least uh, in, in simplistic terms for, for everybody. Um, now that may or may not be 15 minutes, it depends where you are. Um, and you would have a selection. Typically what happens is when we ask that kind of question is you get a selection of things and then the selection says uh, that it will be different in different places. And then you realise, of course, you can't have everything in, within 15 minutes or whatever your term is. You you have a selection of things and then there'll be another neighbourhood next door that you can you can have other things because that's what they want. And then you find you need to get from one to the other. So one of the things that the 15 minute needs city needs is connectivity between, if you like, the 15 minute neighbourhoods. And, and I think neighbourhood is a better term because. We don't exist for a transport system and we don't even exist for a city. Um, actually, we exist to be, uh, you know, the Homo sapiens is a, is a social species. We exist to be with other people and do things collectively and collaboratively. Um, and th that way we that's how we survive as a species. And that's that's something we've kind of lost. 
But actually, if you go back to the neighborhood and say, where do I buy my bread? Where do I buy my newspaper? Wh whatever it is that you, you want to do every day, um, that engenders the, the neighborhood and the neighborhood becomes actually quite small. So what we found is that um, it, there's sort of Robin Dunbar numbers, which are quite controversial in some ways in anthropology, but they're kind of interesting. Um, you sort of that you have, you know, the capacity to have 150 social contacts in your in your um, brain, um, whether it's 150 or 200 or whatever. I don't think the exact number really matters, but it's 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 not 10,000. And um, and when I look at it, you know, I you know I look out of the window on my on the street. Where I live, there's about 100 houses, roughly, a little bit less than 100 houses on my, the street where I live. And I suppose if I added them all up, there would be about 250, maybe 300 possibly people, including all the children and so on here. Um, and that street is a kind of community. Um, and up the road, three, 400 metres up the road, we have like a, a corner shop. We have and various other facilities and there's a load of bus services to go somewhere else and the other end, the other direction. There's part, there's all these sorts of things that are going on. And that's all within this kind of neighborhood. And if I looked at the street that's parallel to this one, there's another one. And and that is what makes a city. And so what we can do with the transport system is to enable, to encourage those kinds of quite small groupings of people to collectivize so that they will survive, they will enable that corner shop to survive. They will supply the passengers to those bus services to go to other neighborhoods, but that we think of it in that very much more organic, cellular kind of way that enables us to be able to, where, where the seat of it all is actually about social communication and, and social existence in the sense of being together and being able to do things. That, I think, is, is something we can do. And then the transport system can then facilitate that. Um, one thing you mentioned earlier was obviously the, the tragedy of the pandemic, but what comes out of it? Amanda Lavetti, the Sterling Prize winning architect, has said that historically cities have actually been shaped by pandemics. Mm. So at an urban scale, the 1870 cholera outbreak in London led to the creation of the sewerage system and wider streets in Victorian Bankman. And even as far back as 16th century houses in Spain, they were painted with lime because of its antibacterial properties that helped prevent the spread of the plague. A lovely example of need expanding into the vernacular and unknown at the time was one of the first examples of nanotechnology in action. Yeah. In terms of what we're learning from this pandemic, not just in terms of how it reshapes our cities, but in terms of progress, maybe with science or technology, what what do you envisage that, that we might might get out of this? Obviously, there's a, a there's lessons with producing a vaccine in record time, but but kind of what what what's your reflections on that? Well, of course, she's absolutely right, um, and I think that because cities cities are there to uh, enable people to thrive, and so if people are dying through a disease, that cities cities will work out how to stop that from happening. So I think uh, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think what I'm seeing with COVID, I think, is uh, we we realise the importance of sociality, um, and you see that with um, the various various things around the world. You know, Italians singing on balconies, or Spanish dancing on roofs, or even even the the, the UK clapping people from time to time. Um, these are expressions actually of sociality, and and I think. The interesting thing for me on that is that's one of the things to learn is, is actually we kind of have lost that. And so getting that back, I think, is a good thing. So what? So how do we design cities in a way that you can have a conversation in them without feeling that it's a real exception and everything's in a rush and, and you can't do it and you're obstructing other people by doing that and things like that. So how do we design cities to be able to do that? And I think that that pushes forward to a very different concept of what we mean by things like urban design and planning. And, um, and I think that is certainly one thing that we're doing. I mean, we're doing a lot of work at the moment with um, Transport for London about the buses and COVID and things like that. And there's a sort of underlying question in there around, well, how many people can you have on a bus? Um, 
And obviously at the moment, uh, that is a small number. Question is, do you want it to go up to the kind of numbers that we had before? And um, and goes back to what I was saying earlier about, well, if actually, if you design your transport system so that you can have a sociable bus as opposed to a crammed full like sardines bus, maybe you actually are creating something else and, and that will turn into the way in which we do transport in the future. And I think that could be a really interesting thing. The other thing um, you mentioned about the, the vaccine, I think that's an interesting one because the thing, why, how, could, how do we manage to create the vaccine as quickly as we did? And I say we, I mean humanity, because it's not just in the UK. Obviously, the, look, this has been going on in all sorts of parts of the world. Uh, and I think the reason, the answer to that question is, um, it's the infrastructure that we invested in in order to be able to do that kind of thinking. Um, and having that in place meant that you could turn your hand to doing something very quickly. So that's the education that the infrastructure in terms of um, obviously things like laboratories and science and things, but actually education um, that enables that to happen and how important that is. Um, and we kind of see it almost like a label or a ticket or something you do until you're 18 or, or whenever. Um, and actually it's fundamental for the survival of the species. So I think those sorts of things, they, I mean, compared with sewage, they're, they're more abstract but actually they're fundamentally important, I think. I suppose air pollution is, is another one. I mean, we, we were aware of air pollution um, before. We knew that air pollution was a, was a bad thing and we don't want it. Um, and we, but we hadn't been thinking about viruses in the air pollution. And I think what COVID has done is made us think much harder about what is in the air and how and so how do we actually research that because at the moment we don't really it's 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 you know if you want you know that will be done in a very very sort of small very concentrated kind of laboratory test uh, but not what does your street look like and and how, what if we were to design the street in this way or that way would it make that better or worse um those sorts of questions we don't really do at scale because it's very difficult. Just, uh, you, you mentioned public transport there, uh, and, and one of the questions that's come in is the, act, the, the attraction of public transport systems is closely related to the frequency of the service, among other things. So cutting the peak to half as imagined in a post COVID world could create a knock on effect of cutting the, uh, the attractiveness of public transport itself. What is the speaker's, what's sort of your view on that? Yep. OK, well, I, um, that's, that's exactly it's a really, really good question. So um, why would we cut the frequency? If, if people you can you can you can do all this without cutting the frequency, you can you can simply reduce the number of people on a vehicle. So that's this is what COVID has fired up, because um, if if at the moment in London, you can have 30 maximum of 30 people on a bus big sign on the door says 30 people on this bus and you have a bus that can carry 90 and um and the question is if you if you retain your frequency you can you'll be carrying essentially a third of the number of people that you would have been carrying if you had 90 fine um and what the, the the economic trick is is that you then in the off peak you may only have two people on the bus or five people on the bus so if in the off peak you were carrying 30 people on the bus you've now increased the off peak and you've decreased the peak and the question is at what point do those balance out and um, it might not be 30. I think it's probably a little bit more than 30. I think it's probably nearer to 50, but it's not 90. And so I, I absolutely agree with the question. Frequency is kind of all. You really have to deliver frequency. And, uh, and the size of the bus is simply the amount of air that you're moving around, not the number of people. And, and if you have a bus where, where you the way that the bus operates enables the bus to have enough air that you can have a, a clean air environment inside the bus um, while it's traveling around. That is where you, where you want to be. And, and I think 
absolutely keep the frequency and in effect keep the size of the vehicle but just the numbers down no so it's a great question so yeah if there are other questions please do type them in and we'll keep it keep an eye on those there is one more which is an interesting sort of challenge i guess to the fundamental logic of cities over past policies is about the focus on agglomeration benefits of cities and that has had very clear negative impact on areas distant from cities and does the neighborhood approach support much more widespread investment of resources and if so what are the transport implications of that yes um absolutely another fascinating question thank you for that um yes i think that is right we have we've gone into a model of agglomeration um actually it's, it's probably almost the other way around. You, you have a city centre and you know, the typical model of a city, I get my students to draw a generic city and they always come up with the same thing. I hope they're not watching this. <laughs> um, but, but they always come up with a sort of centre in the, in the centre and then the city spreads out and it does that over time and, and distance and so on. Um, and that what you end up with is that the resource is all heavily concentrated in the centre. Um, you know, London is a really good example, but actually pretty much every other city in the UK is as well. Uh, you have the resource in the centre and you have a, some kind of transport system that enables people to come in from the outside into the centre. And that gets very crowded as you get nearer to the centre because you've got more and more people on it and so on. So it, that's, that's what we actually have. I think what this is really suggesting, what the neighbourhood thing is really suggesting, is that you actually distribute your economy much, much better. You know, there's, there's a... There are streets, single streets in London that have or had, who knows now, but they, they had a bigger economy than some countries. And, and other parts not very far away of, of, of the city were absolutely destitute and still are. So that inequality, that, that um, really stark difference between the, the very high income and the very low income um, is very it's a very expensive thing to try and maintain that kind of difference and and actually evening it out is actually a really good thing to do so if you took some of the some of the um, stuff that goes on in this in the city center and you make that available to happen outside the city center you will enhance your neighborhoods because the economy of somebody working somewhere and going out for a coffee or um, a, a lunch or something near to where they, where they are doing their work um, is, is going to be an economic enhancement. And you suddenly, instead of having your outer suburbs as almost just dormitory places, they become a more thriving, complete kind of community. You are able to do that. Now that requires a different concept for the transport system. Because instead of the transport system essentially bringing everybody into the centre and being very radial, you're now looking at a transport system which is much more orbital. Um, and where well, it's, it's easier to go around than to go in. And you can go in, and that's fine. Um, but actually, orbital is good. And then you join up your neighbourhoods much more. And you've then distributed your economy much better across the city. And therefore, you, you're going to get much better... Um, outputs in terms of quality of life, in terms of um, health, in, in terms of um, well-being and these sorts of things will be much, much better as you disperse those things around. And the economy of the city as a whole won't change. It might grow, but it won't go less. Because you mentioned the inequalities there and the Michael Marmot, who's, who's written and researched and and advised the government a lot on health inequalities has uh, earlier, well, end of last year actually, the uh, produced the report Build Back Fairer, the COVID-19 Marmot Review, and that looked at the pandemic and socio-economic and health inequalities. And one of the five recommendations was about creating and developing healthy and sustainable places. Just a bit more detail, how, how can we do that and how can the transport system help do that? I think actually, I'd encourage people to read that report. Um, I, I, would, I think it's a really, really good report and people should read it. Um, I would give a slight caveat that the executive summary is 77 pages long. <laughs> um, but it is a really, really important document. And I think uh, it's really important. And one of the things it says in there when it talks about this 
is that by and large, the before the pandemic, the health inequalities in the country, and we're talking UK here, the, the health inequalities in the UK um, were worsening. Life expectancy was beginning to reduce and um, it was slowing down. Um, you had um, the inequalities in health, so the, especially the ones linked to socioeconomic um, situations and so on, were increasing. This was all happening long before COVID and over the past decade. And when you look at what's happened with COVID, it's those inequalities, where those inequalities are greatest is where you see the biggest hit on, on uh, through COVID. So this is not a sudden revelation in, in a sense. And I think that's a really, really, really important point because what it's really saying, what I think Michael is really saying here is actually we've been we've been building up to some kind of health disaster for a decade and um, arguably longer but over that decade we've been able to see that happening it so happens that we've got a, a covid pandemic but it could have been almost anything health-wise would have shown up the kind of um inequalities in impact if you like from the from whatever it is that you see with covid so it's not just due to covid so when we, I hate, I, I don't like the term building back, actually, because I don't think we should be building back. I think, if anything, we should be building forward. Um, and certainly fairer, I, I go with the fairer, and I know why he's used build back. Um, but but I think we should be, we should not be wanting to go back to where we were in 2019, because where we were in 2019 was actually already a pretty bad place. And, and projected to continue getting worse. And so I think where we should be looking at is saying, well, actually we need to deal with these health inequalities. We need to deal with the, the socioeconomic inequalities that give rise to that and exacerbate them and move on. Now, yes, transport is crucial to this because um, it's about how you get access to stuff. And so the first thing I would say is where, where we need to do, and I think transport People have been doing this, so this isn't by any means a criticism of transport, but is actually to conceive transport as being more than just um, roads and rail, um, buses and trains and things like that, but also the footways, the parks, the um, the meeting places, the, the cycleways and all of these sorts of things that all come into that concept of mobility and not just the motorized, not just facilitating the motorized means of transport. And we have been going in that direction a bit in, in the transport world for a while, but actually that becomes even more important because if you're saying actually me walking the 500 meters to, the, to buy a loaf of bread, that is transport. And, um, and that is going to, that loaf of bread is going to benefit the local community by buying it within the local community. And it's going to benefit me health wise and so on. And all of those kinds of things come into it. And we should be seeing transport and health as far more integrated than we've tended to see it, I think. And that would be a really important thing. And therefore, moving forward, we should be seeing transport as part of the health supply, the, the supply of health well, I was going to say health care, but the, the, the facilitator for good health. There are several. Diet is one. Clean air is another and so on. Transport is one of these. And that means that we have to think very hard about how do we get motorised movement? Well, how, or how do we get it without polluting the air we breathe? Um, how do we do it without killing people? How do we do it um, in a way that enhances um, mental well-being? And see and, and think about what are the characteristics for transport system that would do those things? And then how does that then fit into that neighborhood model? And then you're starting to see how transport can be part of the package of how you reduce those inequalities because you're improving access, but in a sustainable um, equitable kind of way and um, how you then 
And what does that mean about the way we design it? So come back to my bus, maybe 30 people on a bus is a jolly good idea because actually it's much easier to have the sociality in, in a bus, which is not so crowded. Um, you can do other things in the bus that's not so crowded. You're changing all the routes so they're not just simply going up and down the main roads, but they're, they're much more distributive and so on. These are things which actually will help that health gain. So I think there is a, as a I think transport, for my mind, transport is actually quite at the core of in those improvements in health. And the problem you have is that people consider health, they get confused between health and medicine. And so they come along, and they, they're looking for an illness. So we're very good at spotting COVID. So, oh, this is a thing we've, we've and what, what our first reaction is get a vaccine to deal with COVID. Great, fantastic. But a vaccine is just a very short term fix. Fixing the issues that mean that COVID or any other disease are become so bad is about fixing society. And so we need to think much more. And this, this is, I think, what underpinning what Michael Marmot is saying is that we have to underpin those societal issues in order to make ourselves resilient to further attacks from disease because they will always we'll, we'll have another one in 10 years time i mean you know it's, it's going to happen um the question is how resilient is society to that and i think what covid has shown is that we have become much less resilient and therefore we need to build the resilience and, and i think transport is part of that part of that resilience if we design it right and i think someone's uh, we've just had a question and now just about bigger challenges on the horizon and one thing that in the wreath lecture the former bank of england governor mark carney said we can't self-isolate from the planet and in that regard how do you think the way covid has changed people's mode of travel affects transport goals to reach net zero carbon by 2050 well i think uh, the reality to that is you're only going to get a chance of doing that if you reduce the amount of um, motor, particularly motorised transport, because ultimately, um, whether you have, any, you know, we could have an electric vehicle, um, and the electric vehicle obviously emits less pollution than um, an internal combustion vehicle. I, I was going to ask you actually about that, given Elon Musk is now the richest man on the planet uh, mm. beating Jeff Bezos so it's been a race for sort of billionaires of what the themes are of the whether it's online shopping or where it's the future of electric vehicles but on the back of Tesla's rocketing share price so I was yeah I think electric vehicles is that part of the solution uh, will that well I think the first thing to say there, there isn't a single but a single silver bullet so they're part of a solution but they're not pollution free um, you have somewhere electricity is being produced. Now, of course, if, if the electricity is being produced in a, in a pollution-free kind of way, then that's good. If it's not, then, you know, it's not so good. But also, don't forget that 50% that of the particulates emitted by a car actually don't come from the engine. And uh, the electric vehicle has all of those. So the bits of rubber on the on the road and the brake um, dust and all of those sorts of things, which go into the PM 2.5s, those all get emitted by electric vehicles and arguably more so than with um, ICE vehicles because um, they're heavier. So, um, th you know, they, they, they come with a, a nice gloss on them um, and they're certainly better, but they're not pure, they're not, actually the answer i think ultimately and and the big the big problem is that in the end we're talking with the laws of physics you know if you want to move a mass a certain distance you need a certain amount of energy to do it and if you are walking down the road you have your how how much it is 70 kilos or stuff to to move around and you require energy to do that and we do that by eating food and etc and and that gives us the energy to be able to make that movement if i put myself in a one-ton car 
I now have to move a ton in 75 kilos. And um, therefore, the energy required is going to be much greater. Even if I didn't do anything about speed or anything like that, it's simply the moving the mass a certain distance. And so ultimately, to, to get the emissions down, we need to get the energy consumption down. I know the two are not the same, but we need to get the energy down. And therefore, you need to reduce the amount of transport you do. And how do, the thing is, we built a life over the past hundred or so years where we have built up the quality of life on the basis of having access to things which are further away than we can walk to. And therefore, we need a transport system to do. You know, that's the way we've developed over the past, but only the past 150 years or so. So how do we actually um, reduce the amount of travel without reducing the quality of life? Well, I think it is. I think that is one of the challenges. We need to kind of break the the supposed connection between increases in quality of life, depending on increases in the amount of travel. We need to break that because it's not true. It might be we might have made it to be true, um, but it isn't necessarily true. So I'm just going to have to seek some power. Um, so it's not necessarily true, and I think. Um, I think we should be working much, much harder at figuring out how you get your quality of life, number one. And then if I can't get that quality of life near to where I am, so I need, you know, it's beyond my physical reach, then we need to find good ways of enabling the connectivity to the point to which I can get it. So, so that means that's when you, you think about your electric vehicles, but you want to try and get as much as you can in in the sort of zone of influence that you can do without having to hit energy requirements um, first. And I think that comes back to, and the obvious thing around that is the neighborhood. So you come back to the neighborhood and, and that's why I think it's so fundamental um, for transport and planning. And at the start, I alluded to your connection of different disciplines. Can you say a bit about the laboratory that you're you're developing at the moment and and how you envisage that will help solve some of the, the challenges? I'll, I'll, I'll leave it vague there so then you can uh, <laughs> over to you to explain a bit more. <laughs> okay, well, um, yes, so to do all these kind of things, that, so what we look at is in, in very broad terms is essentially how people interact with the environment how they move about in it but why what stops them from doing it and actually and we look at that from from a vast range of scales so the laboratory which we are now in the final stages of completing um, uh, enables us to create a life-size environment so we can build a hundred meter long street or a, a town square um, um, or an airport or whatever we can build any of these things at scale and then we put people in them and we study how the people are reacting. And we study that from by the usual way that you might do it now, which is to ask people, so what do you think of this? Do you like that? Um, but also we study their physiological responses to that and we test their psychological responses. So we can see um, whether they are moving differently in different environments, whether they, uh, they change their posture. Do they move closer to people or further away? Do they... Um, are they becoming more nervous? Are they becoming more relaxed? Um, and we can look at things like their heart rate. We can look at their oxygen um, consumption. We can look at their, the way that their eyes, uh, how people's eyes move is a very, very good way of seeing what is bothering them. Um, and we've got now got some brain scanners in there so we can actually look at how the brain is responding as people are interacting with the environment. And those sorts of things um, and the laboratory will enable us to create those environments with quite an interesting degree of both uh, realism and control so we we have a lighting system um, that enables us to simulate daylight from anywhere in the world at any time so as as the sun as the earth goes around the sun and spins around its axis and all that sort of stuff the angle of the sun to anywhere on the earth changes so the color of light in the morning is different from the color of light in the afternoon 
and we can reproduce that because the lighting system we have has is multispectral so so it enables us to to play with the intensity of different bits of the visual spectrum so we can change that and um, then we have a um, a sound system which enables us to reproduce um, the sort of soundscapes that you're familiar with whether they are nice soundscapes or not nice soundscapes or we can we can make it do things like be an explosion or something like that or we can have vehicles moving around and traffic moving around um, and we can change your visibility so you can be in an environment and then it becomes foggy or smoky or whatever and then we can um, change the smell so we can so what happens if how do we we often don't pay very much attention to smell but actually smell is is a very important sense to us and we know really quite little about how smell works in the kind of environmental um, case and then by analyzing all these things together we can do all these things and into that we can then put things like buses and trains and see how people enjoy oh, how should we be designing streets and buses and trains and things to be able to capitalize on that and that's kind of what the idea of the of the laboratory is to enable um, us to know scientifically what's what's going on but also for um, people the public to get a feel for what things are like but but you know what about planners you know you want to put in some scheme though you've usually got options well you could come and build them um, in there and we can see what what how people respond to it you know what works how would your lighting scheme actually work um with people how would they feel about that um you know let's let's try it out rather than write a report that nobody will read or if they do they don't really understand it um come and feel it be there and and see what it looks like and i think you'll get much better participation from the public from doing that if you if you can show them what it would be like if you if you did whatever it is you're trying to do and i think that will enable planners and designers to become much more creative because they're not closed off by thinking that would never work that would no they would never accept this well maybe they would and and i think that would be an interesting thing to try out so it's an interesting space for helping people see different future worlds i guess that they can live in uh which enables that to happen a bit more because i think previously you'd uh you'd alluded to what henry ford had said when he produced uh, obviously henry ford who was the first mass produced cars and he said if he asked if i had asked the public what they uh, would have wanted they would have said faster horses so if he'd listened to the public he would have not been able to think of a different way forward and uh, and the iphone similarly i guess is now ubiquitous but people didn't know that they wanted it until they had it so can you explain that in a bit more detail perhaps in relation to what you've just been saying about how we can achieve what might be beneficial for people, but, but in a way that kind of supports them on that. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, we um, had a project um, to design a bus service for um, older people and disabled people in one of the London boroughs. And, and the idea of this bus service was to, to bring a part of that borough, which was actually quite remote from the center of the borough into the center of the borough so that they could then do things in the center of the borough, the shops and so on, but also that they could then get buses to go somewhere else. And um, so as part of this, we we had to design a bus to do this, which was you know, one, one piece. But another piece was to find out from people in the area where they would like to go, where would they like this bus to, to go? And I sent this poor hapless researcher out. I, I, I still feel guilty about this to this day. I sent this poor hapless researcher out to go and ask um, older people, um, disabled people in this borough um, where they would like to go. And she came back and she was so depressed. It was, <laughs> she said, oh, well, because what they tell me is they don't go anywhere. And, uh, you know, because, because, you know, because when you're old, you don't go out. You, it's, there's nothing for you to do. It's too difficult. It's just too much of a strain and you just don't go out. So she came back with almost, almost a complete zero response to this question. So we thought, well, we've got the funding for this bus. We've got to put it somewhere. So we took the little bits that we did get from them and looked at the road network in the borough and we, we sorted out a route that would 
kind of work and made sort of sense at the time and um, put this into into operation. And I suppose a week after we started, the bus was full, completely full. We had a we had complaints that it wasn't big enough. And so we let that run for, for a while and then we had a we got all the people in and said all the all the users in and said, so you know, uh, you all this is very popular, you obviously all like this bus, you know, so um what do you think of it? And they said Oh, the bus is rubbish um, because um, because it doesn't go where we want to go. And it's a, and you know you you get on the bus, it goes up the road, you see where you want to go, and it turns off. And we said, well, so we realised we had to go and say, well, you never told us you wanted to go there. Um, and and of course they didn't know. That they wanted to go there until they'd been on the bus and saw it, and and I think it's a really it's a really good example of um, you kind of got to put the thing in action in order to find out what people really want from it, and then they'll tell you it's something else. But they're telling you that on the basis of what you've done, and so we could adjust the bus route, and so it went to where they wanted to go, and the, and it's. It was very they were all very happy after that and it was absolutely fine but i think i think that idea of of enabling people to try something out before you've before you've stuck it all down and set it in concrete i think is is a really 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 good point and i think you can and what this laboratory will enable um, people to do is to do precisely that that they can you know, if they want to sort of say, well, what, what should the lighting look like in our high street? What would you like the lighting to be? We want to reduce the cost and we want to do this, but what would you like it to look like? There's lots of different ways of doing that. Well, the first thing that that local authority could do is to come to, the, uh, come to us and we could show them the whole range of lighting that they could have. I mean, not just in terms of products, but what kind of light do you want? So what do you say to the light, lighting manufacturer? Instead of you, instead of the lighting manufacturer saying to you, "This is the light that we produce and it costs X," you go to the lighting manufacturer and say, "This is the light we want." And nowadays, the big difference in the last small number of years, five years maybe, the big difference is with um, LEDs coming in as the as the as the, as the lighting um, mode of choice. As LEDs coming in, the pricing coming down, and so on. Um, actually, you have almost, almost, not quite, but almost infinite choice of what you want that light to be. The question is, all you have to do is say, and um, and the manufacturer will make it. And essentially, one costs the same as another. It doesn't really matter. And and but a lot of people just don't realise that they've got that kind of choice, and it's a huge choice. So they can, you could come. To the laboratory and you say well what would it look like if we had this color well here is this color you know here is that color here is another color here is something else this is brightness this is this is more focused and nuanced lighting this is what it would do you can come and try all that inside the laboratory and that is very helpful for you as a designer um, but it's also helpful to us because from all of that we learn the more we learn the better we can we can help in the future and so it's a real win-win um, Kind of situation and then you can bring your public in and you can say what do you think of this and so you might say well that's all very well you've got this one laboratory it's the only one on the planet um how do you do that well i think we can do that and it comes back to in a way what we're doing now um because i think we can get give people a it won't be the same full experience of being immersed inside the environment um, of, in this case, the laboratory, but you would be able to see it and you could ask interactively and you could go and look and say, well, if it was a bit more blue, what would happen? Um, those sorts of things. We could do that because one of the things we have done is to install a huge capacity internet system so that we can actually send that kind of information out in real time interactively so that we can do things and actually we have projects for that for the laboratory which are being run from japan for example 
so I think we can we can do some uh, interesting interesting things for for planning and design. I think you've alluded to kind of it's uh, we've got ten minutes left, but it's that connection between transport and particularly car use uh, historically. Looking back in looking back, I guess referencing the Marmot report earlier. Uh, looking back, there was always a connection between the two economic growth and vehicle miles travelled. But then with the internet, obviously, that, that changes. And one of the questions that we've got is, in the summer of 2019, the European Environmental Bureau published Decoupling Debunked. And that was analysing if sustainable growth was possible. The, paper conc- the paper's conclusion was the case for economical sufficiency rather than economical growth. Can the Western world be ready for such a concept and can transport facilitate this in the Western economic model? And one of the other questions we've got is, should the purpose of all, and I think it kind of helps with this, is should the purpose of all transport professionals be to improve the quality of life for everyone? Well, at the latter point, I say that's, why else would you do it? I mean, I absolutely, absolutely go along with that. That's precisely what we're um, teaching our students to do and 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 it does change the way that you do that but yes so absolutely and so actually you're I think I think economic growth is is actually a really quite harmful way of looking at um, uh, the, a way of deciding how to do things I think economic it, it, because it's extremely monocular um, you can it's it's a very narrow kind of thing. What's I think you you really we really need to have. I mean, one of my colleagues, Henrietta Moore, would, would talks about prosperity, and what she means by prosperity is there will be some economic angle in there, but actually, just simply the economics isn't enough. It's got to be um, a quality about it. It's got to be um, the sense that. Uh, well-being, the sense of ease, the sense of being able to work with the range of people within the area and all of those sorts of things that actually is important. And economics is one kind of part of that, but everything else is important. And I think that in a way, transport is one of the ways of actually helping that happen because we can enable if we if we think of transport as something which brings people together rather than takes them away because uh, come back to the point that we are a social species that we thrive actually from sociality but what we've often done is we've compressed the whole thing into a highly dense kind of environment in which um, sociality is actually very difficult if you if you remember um, Edward Hall's sort of social spacing thing and, and he goes to all these various social spaces blah, 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 and you come down to the intimate space and the intimate space is sort of within about 40 centimeters and within 40 centimeters um, you only allow people into that space who you wish to be in that space you know very friends or whatever however that is but that's somebody else coming into that space is an act of aggression Now, you know, the Tokyo Metro operates at something like seven people per square meter. And so if you look at a picture of people in the Tokyo Metro, um, you'll find that they contort themselves. It's amazing how bendy the body is in order that they do not actually face each other. So that they don't, they can kind of convince themselves that they're not actually having somebody in that very, um, as Edward Hall called it, intimate space. This is not... A civilized way of of actually doing something least of all going to work when you're going to have to go and do something at the other end of it so we should not be designing a transport system that does that we should be designing a transport system which enables us to be able to do that in a much much more appropriate way and actually funnily enough what we know from our own experiments is if you do that it will be much much more effective um, because it's much much easier to get on and off um, a train that is not full of people to the extent of seven people per square meter. So, so actually it works always around. So I think, yes, growth is not the answer. I, uh, and economic growth is not the answer. I think it is all about quality of life and it is all, and then in there is um, 
health, but not just simply saying you get, you've got health because you've got a good health service. You need a good health service, but actually health is not needing to use the health service. And can we actually make our world, um, especially in the urban areas, can we make that world such that you don't need to use the health service because you are so healthy? And transport is a major player in doing that. And so is the design of the environment within which the transport works. So to me, going forward out of COVID, what I see is actually is that um, urban design and its rural counterpart, if one can make that distinction, um, that the, the sort of urban or public design, should we call it, the public design, including the public transport system, actually are the leaders of the creation of quality of life because they can create the environment in which health happens both physical and mental and they can enable people to access the opportunities that they need like employment and so on and to be able to get good quality food and all of those kinds of things that make us all healthier they are actually fundamental to it so instead of us thinking about sort of design planning transport as being kind of on the end of having a city and what do we do with it actually they are the core of it and that actually is really important city of london um very interesting you look at a map of the city of london and you'll see if you compare it with a map from say the 14th century um you'll see a lot of the roads are the same in the actual i'm talking about the actual city and um and they were created because somebody walked from one place to another place and they dodged the puddles and the slightly softer ground and and so on and so they created a kind of path and then people built the buildings around the paths and in a way i think metaphorically at least that's where we might be wanting to think about in the future that actually what is it we want to access how do we access that um, in the most sustainable way possible which is effectively to be walking or its equivalence if you're in a wheelchair or whatever how do we access that and if you can't access that what's the next thing that you do and that is actually the essence of how we actually move forward and progress into a into a wholesome um, prosperous thriving society so we see the city as a much more of a vital organism of a you know with cells and or, working together each one being healthy creating a healthy city and within that healthy city you have healthy people and the core of that is the transport and planning system well thank you i mean it's always uh, always a delight to uh, to speak with you nick and thank you so much for your time today uh, that was uh, professor nick tyler